Yeah, so like the pump get the ballot. Put it in there. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I know exactly where I am. Yeah, I think some part of the process. It doesn't matter. It says here that, you know, that something about. Uh, I hear by applied, you know, a ballot and careful in future elections to lay request of the wider variety. Well, we want to know. Uh, all right, scholars, today we are going to cover list, stacks, QEs, and priority QEs, <clears throat> which is a common topic you'll need if you take a more advanced programming class called data structures. So a data structure is a collection of data organized in some fashion. Not only stores data, but also can support operations for accessing and manipulating data, making changes to it, deleting it, adding to it, etc. <clears throat> so a collection is a container of objects that holds a group of objects, elements, so similar to an array. The Java collections framework has two types of collections possible. One stores a collection, simply known as a collection. It stores an object. The other stores multiple, a key with a value pair, which is called a map. <clears throat> so if it's an individual collection, let's say all strings, that would be a collection. If you had, let's say, first and last name, that would be a map. You had user ID with name, that would be a map. <clears throat> so here's an example. Set and list. They're both sub-interfaces of collection. So you might have a nav navigable set, a tree set, an abstract set, a sorted set, Whereas a list, you might have a list interface, a QE interface. You might have an abstract sequen sequential list, an abstract QE, a priority QE, linked list, array list. We've seen that before. Vector, stack, etc. So within the collection interface, obviously, it's implemented as an interface. You could possibly use an iterator within it. That's that plus plus. We add one as we go through a specific loop. But we also have that collection option. We can add a Boolean. We can add a collection of Booleans. We can clear them. We can create a container of objects, et cetera. <clears throat> so this adds us to allow any new element to the collection, remove any elements from the collection, return the elements from the collection, et cetera. So if you had, let's say you created a bunch of circle objects, you would be able to use that collection interface to return all of them at once to delete one, add one, change one, depending on what you need. So in iterator, the definition is a classic design pattern for walking through a data structure without having to expose the details of how data is stored in the data structure. It just makes it simpler. You've seen it before with the for loops. 
So within this newest update of Java, there's now a method called for each, which allows you to create a new loop based on each instance that you need. Hence, for each. It's a certain kind of for loop that's related to each specific instance. The list interface, as I'm sure you can guess from the name, is a list that stores elements in a sequential order and allows the user to specify where the element is stored. It's just the same idea as with an array. You list the concepts, whatever bunch of strings you have, bunch of integers, the same type of idea. As you see in the next slide, you could add any kind of element, integer, object, boolean, collection, etc. All of them can be added together into that one list. So you have a list, you may have four strings, five integers, one object. Can all be added together in that specific list. And that's the primary reason you would use a list instead of an array. An array, you have to have all of your elements the same type. So you have an array of integers, an array of strings, an array of booleans. Whereas a list, you can use all of them together. <clears throat> you may use the iterator class in order to create a new element, a new object, a new string, <clears throat> a new double, a new car, char for character. Add all of them into your list using that list iterator class. Now we'll see some of this when we go through the programs together in class on Thursday. <clears throat> so you've already seen an array list. It has that triangle triangle around it, <clears throat> or you can add list items to an array. There's also a linked list. So the array list is going to offer you a collection. You can add all different types. But a linked list is a little different. So the array list and linked list are both taken from that list interface. <clears throat> if you need random access to your index, you're probably going to do an array list because your array list, okay, this is your first number is in the zero index, your second number is in the one index, or as a link list, okay, we have this element, we know exactly where it's being stored. It's linked. So whatever that storage area is, we can retrieve it immediately. <clears throat> So here's an example. You would create a new collection called C and extends E. See these triangles or less than sign question mark extends E greater than sign. We're extending an array, an array list of that new collection. So first we create the array list using the method. Then we add a collection to it. Then we set an empty list that extends E. Then we create its capacity. How big do we want it to be? So we could do int and then let's say it's 20 integers. Then if we wanted to make that smaller, we could use the trim to size method. So the reason you want to use a linked list is it's much easier 
to remove or add elements that you want to add into the array. So you could either add an element at the beginning of the array or link list rather using add first, or you could add it to the back end of the link list with add fit last method. You do the same then with remove first or remove last. Take something off the beginning, take something off the end. <clears throat> or as an array, you have to literally find, okay, what, what element do we want to move or get rid of? What element do we want to add? A link list, you just type in the method. Okay, we want to remove the first. Okay, it's gone. We want to remove the last. Okay, it's gone. We want to add a new piece of the list. Okay, do you want to add it at the beginning or do you want to add it at the end? If you add it at the beginning, it goes before all of the previous pieces of the link list. You add it at the end, it just goes on in the end. <laughs> you may recall from previously, comparable, where we did that equals equals to make sure, oh, if we want to check that this is a string, string n equals equals q. And we check and make sure that these match. The comparator interface allows us to do the same type of thing. Compare each type of element. We use the comparator when we're unsure. The comparable we pretty much are sure you saw that with the exception handling. We compared a string to a, or was it an integer to a string to double check that it was the exception mismatch for the type. Comparator allows you to compare any different type without throwing a specific error message. So you would use the method public int compare your first element, your second element. So it would return a negative value if element one is less than element two and a positive value if element one is greater than element two and zero if they're equal. So in this instance, integer. So if element one was six and element two was four, yeah. it's going to return a positive value. Six is greater than four. Yeah. If element one was five and element two yeah. was eight, it's going to return a negative value. Let's say they're both eight. Yeah. Then we would get a zero. So let's say you enter or ask user input to get your element one and your element two. You would know what they entered to some degree based on what the return value is. If you had a negative number, then you knew that element two was the larger number. If you had a positive value, then you would know that element one was the larger value. If you received a zero, you knew that the user inputted the same number for each element. Same thing would apply if you called this public double compare. And you had 1.1 1 .1 and 3.1. You get a negative value. Element 1 of 1.1 1 .1 is less than 3.1. <clears throat> Same thing would apply with a object. If your object element one was a bigger size, let's say we made a rectangle and we made a circle. In theory, 
the rectangle is going to be bigger than the circle. Assuming you went ahead and set size parameters, et cetera, radius, area, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So similarly, you could use the comparing method. Now, the difference is this, when you use this, it's going to tell us which option is better. It's going to compare your two options and tell us which one is better. So here we're creating an array list of loans. <clears throat> we have two new loans here. <clears throat> Five point five percent over ten years. We're paying twenty three twenty three, and the second option is five percent over ten years, paying one thousand a month. So, which one do you think would be better based on this comparison? No guesses? Which do you think would be better for you? The second option, we have a lower percentage. Both of them have the same number of years. The second option has a the lower percentage. amount we're paying. Zaza, go ahead. No, I was saying the lower percentage. Yep. The second one's probably going to be better. We have a lower percentage. And we're paying a lower amount. 5% is lower than 5.5%. Paying $1,000 a month is less than $23.23 a month. So in that comparator instance, that second loan option would be our better choice. Lower percentage, lower amount per month. However, there are instances within that method where you can solely compare one of the parameters. So in this instance, we're comparing get the loan amount, whatever the calculation is. So that second option here is going to be our better option because that loan amount, 5% over 10 years, $1,000 a month, it's going to be less than 5.5% over 10 years, paying 23.23 a month. But in this second example, we're solely comparing the annual interest rate. So in the previous example, we're comparing everything. Okay, the years are the same. So that's a wash. The interest is better in the second one. How much we're paying each month is better than the second one. So the second one comes out as the winner. In this example, we're only comparing the annual interest rate with that dot then comparing. So in this example, we're only looking at the 5.5% and the 5%. So the 5% is lower. That's going to be our answer. But if we change that to 5.8%, now what's our, our winner? If we increase the second loan from 5% to 5.8%, who's now got the lower annual interest rate? Which number is lower? 5.5 or 5.8? The 5.8 is higher. So now our 5.5 will be the annual interest rate. We go back to the 5.0. That second option, again, is our better 
annual interest rate. But as I mentioned, it's only determining based on that annual interest rate. As you saw in the previous example, we're comparing everything. What's the overall loan amount? So the second option wins, lower percentage, lower payment per month. <laughs> Whereas in the second example, we only care about that annual interest rate. So whichever of the first numbers is lower, that's what we're gonna take. It doesn't matter in this example that now the first example, we're only paying $100 a month as opposed to a thousand. If we simple ha simply had this just comparator get loan amount, we would output the first loan because we're only paying a hundred bucks a month as opposed to a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. It would make that extra 0.5% interest negligible because we're paying 10 times less. But since we're only comparing that one piece, it only cares about which one of the interest percentages is lower. So back to the collections, there's a class you could create or import that contains various static methods for allowing you to perform common operations to add to your collection. So you can do a number of things within that collections class. You can sort through your list. You can compare them. You can use binary search. You can reverse the order. You can shuffle them. Another way of randomizing. Let's say you have eight elements in your collection and you don't care what order they are. You could go ahead and shuffle them. Okay, two can go to four, eight can go to five, etc. You can also create copies of the pieces of your list. That's best when you are going to overwrite one of your elements. Say you want to change integer n from eight to seven, you can go ahead and make a copy of integer n and keep that initial number and then make a second version of it. <clears throat> Let's say n1 and n2, and they each have different values for them. You can also fill, <clears throat> which adds a new item. You could even set a max and min for your collection. That's helpful because of the storage possibilities. If you create a collection of, let's say, 25 strings, that may be all you need. Let's say you're creating a collection of your favorite websites, for example. You may only have 10 favorite websites. Let's say you're getting the input from the user. You may only want them to be able to input eight favorite websites, 10 favorite websites, five favorite websites, based on the available storage. Like in the example assignment we did last week, you wanted the user to input an X and the Y for your factorial. So you may even set a min for your collection. Okay, we need two numbers. Okay, our minimum's got to be two. So there are also what are called vector and stack classes that you could use. They basically are old school methods that allow us to compact. Yeah, Retain compatibility. So you have two strings, two integers. We want to make sure they're always strings and integers unless we're overwriting. 
So over time, the vector class was replaced by an array list. It contains synchronized methods for accessing and modifying a vector. You may not see it based on these advances in Java these days, but in essence, they would all have to be the same. Strings, integers, you can't create an array list or vector with different types. So you couldn't have an integer, a string, a Boolean all together. And it would have the same type of items or options as an array list. You could add an element, you could remove an element. You could set the size, how many elements do you want? <clears throat> However, the stack is still somewhat used. It basically allows you to put all your elements one on top of each other and you're able to retrieve them. Okay, we have index seven, what's in there? You can add to it, you could remove to it, but it's always put on the top. <clears throat> so think of like Jenga, no matter where you take your piece, it goes on the top, right? That's the same idea with the stack method. Okay. <clears throat> so you create a stack using the stack method. This line empty Boolean is asking, what's in that stack? Is there anything put in the stack so far? If it is in fact empty, it'll return an answer of true. If you've put, you know, five things in the stack, then it's going to return false because there's items in the stack. So think of it like a Pringles case. You have one Pringle stacked on top of the other. And you remove them, you take them out one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, however many you eat at a time. You go ahead and you eat them, right? So that's now removed how big the stack is, how many elements there are stacked one on top of each other. So if you do peak, that just returns whatever is at the top of that stack. So if you had a stack of integers one, two, three, four, five, if you did peak, okay, Five's at the top, it returns five. If you did pop, that's going to get rid of that top element. <clears throat> so it'll output five and take it off the stack. So now you, the top of your stack is four. Whereas push allows you to add a new element to the top of the stack. So if you add your stack one, two, three, four, five, and you do push, what's now the top of the stack? B6. One, two, three, four, five, all stacked on each other. We add a new piece to the stack. It'd be the next number, six. <clears throat> and then you could also search. What's in the stack? I, I want to find out where certain things are in the stack. You would use that search method. So then there are queries and priority queries. So think of a query as your grocery list. The order of it may not matter. You know, you, you want a, a dozen eggs, you want a tomato, you want a box of cereal, it doesn't matter. You're gonna go and find them in no specific order. <clears throat> Most people, when they think of QEs, they just think of a print QE. It's just a list of your items you sent to be printed. It doesn't matter which one goes first, it's just an unordered list. Whereas a priority QE is, you know, your bills. 
You put them in order based on their due date. There's a priority to them. Okay, the electric bill is due today. The water bill's due next week. You're going to pay the electric bill today. If you have the money, you might pay both bills. But you could technically hold off on the other bill until next week when it's due. So that's the difference. A QE is just, okay, as long as we get all this done, it's fine. A priority QE is everything has an importance value to it. I have to do this first. Then I could do this. Then I could do this. So think of like your to-do list. You usually write down the most important thing first, and then the importance lowers based on each item. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say you have four classes. The priority QE would basically be your assignments each week. Okay, this is due first, this is due second, this is due third, this is due fourth. You put them in order. How much time do I have before I need to complete them? Whereas a QE may be, you know, your outside activities. Oh, I want to go play basketball today. Oh, I want to uh, go to the gym today. It may not necessarily have any priority to it. You you could do it at some point after your classes. <clears throat> so that's why the QE, like I mentioned, a printer, whatever sent in first. Okay, I printed uh, slides fifty five and 56. Then I printed 57 and 58. It doesn't necessarily matter when they're done, but one was sent in first, the other was sent in second. So the first one's going to come out first, the second one's going to come out second. Whereas, like I said, with priority, what's the most important? That is your first priority. What's the second most important? The second priority, et cetera, et cetera. That's why I mentioned with a QE, think of your grocery list. It's just whatever you wrote down, first, second, third, fourth, you may go walking through the grocery store and find those specific items based on that order. But it, it doesn't really matter. You'll get all of the items eventually. There's a priority QE. You have an order. You're going to do each thing. So I mentioned the bills. Okay, there's a due date. Okay, I'm going to pay the bills that are due today, today. The bills tomorrow, we can hold off until tomorrow. They're not a priority today. They're a priority tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> So when you have just a regular QE, yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you can insert any element into yes, that awesome. query using the offer method. Then you use the poll method. Okay, what is what is our current QE? What, what's there? What is happening? The remove class, or method rather, removes whatever is in your QE. So let's say you have five things in the QE. The first one's done. You go ahead and remove it. But yeah. if that was the only item in the QE, and now your QE is empty, it's going to throw an exception. There's nothing in the QE for us to remove. So here's an exception. Here's an error. We're telling you, hey, there's nothing to remove. Whereas peak just tells us what's there. Well, what's at the top of the QE? What's being worked on right now? Are you going to get the eggs? Are you printing out the slideshow? But the same idea. If there's nothing there within the QE, Instead of throwing an exception, it just returns a null value. It's missing. It's not there. 
There's nothing for us to tell you. <clears throat> then the element just shows what is that? So it's similar to your peak method, but it doesn't necessarily give you a null value. It doesn't tell you, hey, there's nothing in the query because it's going to do the same thing as the remove method. It's going to throw an exception. <laughs> but it doesn't delete. So it's basically a combination of your remove and peak. If there's something there, it'll tell you about it. If there's nothing there, it'll throw you an exception like the remove, but it doesn't return a null value. It's either going to tell you or throw an exception. Whereas a peak is either going to tell you or tell you there's no, nothing there, it's missing. Remove, tells you what it is, gets rid of it. And if it's empty, there's nothing for it to remove, then there's an error. With the element, if there's nothing to tell you about what's there, it throws an exception. So they each have their specific role. <clears throat> now, the one you're more li than likely going to want to use is that peak method. Because it'll just tell us, okay, something's at the top. Or if there's nothing at the top, it's just null. There's nothing there. Whereas the other two are going to throw an exception. And you have to handle that exception to avoid the program running, compiling, being able to be used. <clears throat> so you can use link lists for queues. You'd have your collection interface, your list interface, your QE interface, all working together to create that new linked list. So, okay. We have a website. It's stored in this storage area. We remove it. It's gone from the QE. We have this string. We want to return it. Okay. It's returned. It's now removed from the QE. If the QE is empty, depending on which of these methods you're using, you'll either get the null value or the exception thrown. <clears throat> the priority QE is a little different. You're going to first use priority QE method in order to create your new QE. <clears throat> then you're going to set whatever the capacity of the QE is. So let's say you have four classes and each class gives you one homework assignment a week. You're going to set your priority QE based on what do they do each day. So if you have four classes as an example and four assignments, you're going to set that capacity is four. You only have four assignments to worry about all week. That's fine. <clears throat> then you're going to use priority QE collection extends E in order to create that priority QE as a collection. <clears throat> then you're going to create a priority QE that utilizes that capacity and your comparator. <clears throat> In this example, you might set up, okay, your four assignments. They all would have to be of the same type. So you would have four strings. You would use that comparator. 
okay, uh, this priority is more important than that priority. We're going to return that priority. And you'll see these in class on Thursday when we go through the programs together <clears throat> on how they specifically work. And also, I believe in two weeks as well, we'll talk more about implementing them and how to utilize them. But as you've seen in our Thursday class sessions, when we go through these programs together, they're a little easier for us to work through. And you can notice how each of these specific aspect, uh, aspects are applying to one another. So in this example, you'd create a new priority QE. What's most important, that will be the top of the QE. What's least important, will be at the bottom of the queue, at least within the priority queue. As mentioned with the regular queue, it's just going to put random order. What did you do first? Like your grocery list. You have each item just put written down. There's no specific order to them. It doesn't matter. You just go and you find each item based on what specifically you need. <laughs> and as always, I've provided specific additional videos here. If you so choose to look through them. <clears throat> so in class on Thursday, we're going to go through <clears throat> how to work and utilize these. So the homework, and I'll show you an example on Thursday for this week, is going to be write a Java program using what you've learned about lists to allow an individual to add their name to an array and return the full array. It should be at least three people plus whatever the user of the input is. And I'll show you how to do an example of that on Thursday, along with, let's say, three or four other examples we'll do in class, like usual. <clears throat> but the idea is that's just going to be a regular stack list. <clears throat> Whoever's put in last is going to be at the top of the list. So let's say our three people are Zaza, Calvin, and Grace. And then we put in <clears throat> Amelia as that user input. So Amelia would be at the top of that list now. So if we put in Zaza, Calvin, Grace, and then the user input was Amelia, let's say Zaza was the top previous, Amelia would be on top of Zaza on the list. And as I mentioned last week, you'll notice that this is homework assignment nine, and next week is 10. <clears throat> and that's our last assignment, even though we still have a couple of other classes. As I said, that is because <clears throat> later in the semester, once we get through everything, there'll be a take home exam. That's in the 1114 folder, but won't be due until 1214. So I think that's about three weeks you'll have to do that. It's just going to be three programs that you have to put together. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, you have that group project. <clears throat> and we set all of that last week with the groups, right? So hopefully you went over to the groups tag. <clears throat> Can you say the groups again, Professor? Yes. So I'm assuming you all have access to the groups tab on Blackboard, but the groups last week we set were Zaza and Franny, Amelia and Grace, Lana, Al, and Calvin. <clears throat> so if you're in that groups tab, there's this little envelope that you could click to send messages to each other. I know your generation tends to do that group chat. 
So you could go ahead and message each other to get the numbers. You go ahead and <clears throat> communicate with one another. Now, as I mentioned, I provided examples for everyone <clears throat> on each of the possible options, the hangman game and the tic-tac-toe game. However, in your presentation, you're going to demonstrate whichever one you did. So keep in mind that you need to have a 20 minute presentation. So obviously the hangman game is going to take longer for you to demonstrate it as opposed to the tic-tac-toe game. You can complete a tic-tac-toe game in two minutes, whereas a hangman game might take 10 minutes. So keep that in mind. I always suggest whenever you're preparing for a presentation, to always try and do it beforehand, a little practice. So 20 minutes, for example, you're asked to explain why you chose which one of the two game options, how you created the game, how long it took, who did what section. So if that only takes you eight minutes to talk about, and you did the hangman game as an example, and that takes 10 minutes to demonstrate, you have two minutes that you have to make up. So you might just, hey, let's talk a little longer. Or, hey, we need to add some more to one of these sections. Whereas the <clears throat> tic-tac-toe game, like I said, that may only take two or three minutes to demonstrate. So your talking aspect of that 20-minute presentation may be much, much longer. And as I mentioned, we have basically the back end of the class set up. So 11.28, 11.30, 12.5, and 12.7 for those presentations. <clears throat> so if we get all of them done that first week, that second week could be set up with extra credit options for those that need it choose to do it <clears throat> so i think with three groups we should be able to get all three done in one specific day so maybe because 11 28 is right after the thanksgiving holiday maybe we just kind of meet for a little while and you could ask any last minute questions about the group project and then they could all be presented on the 30th <clears throat> and then 12.5 and 12.7 could be used for extra credit if you so choose to do it, if you so need it. And I just realized that I all, I'm all i only sharing the PowerPoint. Did anybody actually see that and follow along with what I was talking about on Blackboard? Uh, but the groups tab, yeah, I saw it. Okay. So again, on the groups tab, <clears throat> I think it'll just show you your group. <clears throat> and you should be able to message all of the other group members. Like I said, I understand your generation tends to want to use a group chat. That's fine. Go ahead and message each other the numbers and go ahead and set that group chat up. Because as I mentioned, that'll be here before you know it. And like I said, we have homework assignment nine this week, homework 10 next week. And then the only things left are the take home exam and that group project. So you're going to have time available to work on those. So if there are no other questions, I will leave it there and see everybody on Tuesday or uh, Thursday, rather, for <clears throat> examples of programming code on how to work through all of this. Like I said, I believe, again, in two weeks, we'll do implementing lists, stacks, and QEs. So you'll get multiple instances where you'll see how all of this specifically works. And that's the way I like to see it. You know, the programming code helps us visualize what all these concepts mean. Because when you just hear the concepts out loud, they may be quite difficult to understand. But once you see them in action, 
Oh, okay, now I understand that. Oh, okay, now I understand that method. <laughs> All right, so if there are no questions, I will see everyone on Thursday. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, bye, Professor. Have a good one. Okay,